Well, let's continue our discussion of sapphires. Last class, we talked about the blue sapphires and fancy sapphires, the, course, the sources of their color. I introduced the term pod parasha to you. And today what we're going to do is we're going to move on away from some of that and go into treatments. And then after we're done with talking about how sapphires can be treated, we'll look at the different geographic regions. Treatment can produce a wide range in market value for sapphires. Stones that are unheated and remain beautiful are far, far more expensive than those that have had any kind of treatment done to them. So a wide range of market value is going to occur because of treatment. Some of our, them are accepted in the, com in the community and others are not. One of the treatments that is accepted is called heat treatment. And what we'll say here is that most blue sapphires, it's something like 95% of them that you see for sale are heat treated. Are heat treated. This is an acceptable practice. It is a, something that is done to either lighten very dark sapphires, very dark sapphires, or to reduce the amount of inclusions that end up like this one here, right? Impeding light. This occurs so much of the time. There's a wide range of different temperatures that people do, but it's around 800 degrees C to 1800 degrees C, depending on what people really want to do. And this is accepted and supported by the industry. The Maybe the best example of blues being treated is that, um, is that, is that word from last class, the Gouda. Let's see, it's G-E-U-D-A. And this is that cream colored, where if you put it in a reducing environment, it turns into a stable blue. This stable blue upon heating, stable blue upon heating, comprises a large portion of the market. There's other things that are heated as well. For example, fancy sapphires. So let's, oh man, fancy sapphires like let's say a light yellow sapphire, that would be heated in order to make the color more saturated. So fancy sapphires are heated and we heat them in order to improve saturation. Go from a light yellow to a canary yellow. That would be the goal. Here's an example of heat treatment of a Gouda stone where this stone has been split in two, and the right side is what it looked like coming out of the ground, all right? So that is raw. And then this is the blue color that it turns into upon heating. You can see that there's a very pronounced change, and this is accepted by the industry. Now the last type of treatment that we'll talk about is not really accepted by the, and this is where the lower end stones which have fractures, end up being glass filled, or they're poor color and they're dyed. So the lower end stones may have glass filling of fractures, or they also may be dyed. Let's say their color doesn't change upon heating. Well, if they use the right kind of Pigments, you can maybe get a thin veneer of color on the outside that then will make the stone look like it's worth more than it actually should be. That is not accepted. So the areas where sapphires come from in the world is the thing that we should finish up talking about with sapphires. So we're going to go D, and this is going to be sources. There's very many different sources about the world for different sapphires and three of them we're going to go in today because they are the most famous. The I can show you a map. This is also sourced from GIA's resources and we can see where in the world sapphires come from. There are so so many. But the most famous location in all the world is here up in the high Himalaya. It's a place called Kashmir and we'll start with that. We're also going to talk about Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka is a source of blues and goudas and also fancy sapphires. In fact, most of the big sapphires in the world come from Sri Lanka, like 100 carat plus. And then finally, 
we're going to talk about sapphires that are made in the USA, coming from Montana. So let's first start off with Kashmir sapphires. Kashmir. Kashmir is a region up in the high Himalaya, and these are the most desirable sapphires in the world. Desirable on the market. The problem with the Kashmir sapphires is they essentially haven't been mined since 1887, and that's a fairly interesting story. What ended up happening was in 1881, there was a landslide in the high Himalaya, and that landslide ended up exposing an area of rock and a deposit of beautiful blue sapphires. So let's say this, this landslide exposed a deposit, it's an A deposit, of beautiful sapphires, blue sapphires. It get this, you get the Kashmir name from this location, and so it's a velvety blue. The actual deposit, them, or the actual formation of the deposit itself comes from a place where a pegmatite, remember that word from our discussion on geology, a pegmatite intruded into into sedimentary limestones. And it was at the contact between those two rocks you got the right chemistry to produce these sapphires. So mining occurs starting in 1881 when they find this deposit, but it only continues. It's such a small deposit that the mining actually ends in 1887, is the short range of mining. It was very heavily mined during that time, and many hundreds to thousands of stones were recovered. One of the reasons why we haven't returned and done much mining in this area is because it's above 5,000 meters. So this is very rugged terrain. So yeah, the question would be, why not continue? And maybe we'll return there someday if they're so valuable and they demand such a premium. Well, the terrain is incredibly rugged and it's in a place where it's very uh, politically unstable. And has been politically unstable for a long period of time. Right? We're thinking this is kind of like, like Taliban country, or it was Taliban country a few decades ago. Let's see, do I have any beautiful, I don't have any specific jewel to show you from here, but I do want you to know it's the most beautiful place, or the most beautiful stones in the world come from Kashmir. And the most expensive one ever sold was called uh, the Jewel of Kashmir. That's the most famous, or that's actually the most expensive blue sapphire ever sold. The Jewel of Kashmir. You can look it up on Wikipedia if you want to see it. It ended up selling for $6.7 million in 2015, and it was about a 30 carat stone. You do the math, it ends up being like $250,000 per carat. That was an expensive stone. Now let's move on to Sri Lanka, the little the island off the tip of India, because Sri Lanka is a very fascinating source for all gems. It's like this island that sources almost every gem you could imagine, and Sri Lanka has been the primary global source for sapphires for the last 2,000 years. The geology of the Sri Lankan deposits, they are alluvial. Remember what that means? Alluvial means worn by rivers. So these are, these are, um, these are river gravels. And a secondary deposit. And a secondary deposit, right? We don't actually know what rock they're specifically coming from. But... The river gravels that do have the sapphire enrichments are draining areas of the world um, from this ancient, uh, how do we say this? They are draining a metamorphic terrain from an ancient, from ancient mountain belt. Mountain belt. That's the geology of the Sri Lankan sapphires. The government in Sri Lanka recognizes that they have this beautiful 
source and they want to keep it and they do not want it to go away quickly. They want people to be employed. And so they have instituted a rule that says you may not have mechanized equipment, which is kind of a strange concept. But the government has decreed, is what we'll put down, no mechanized recovery. Modern techniques are not going to be allowed, backhoes, and, and etc. So people are only doing this by the sweat of their brow and with shovels. And that maintains jobs and maintains material. Maintains jobs and material. The colors of the Sri Lankan sapphires are every color. So we're going to say Sri Lankan sapphires occur in every color. But what do the Sri Lankans value the most? Well, they value the most the Padparasha. Because they are the source, the primary global source of that Padparasha salmon, orangish, pink color. And then the last thing that's interesting about Sri Lankan sapphires is that they tend to they can be huge. Most of the largest sapphires, we're gonna say this, tend to be large. Almost all of the 100 plus carat stones available in the museums and royal families today come from Sri Lanka. So 100 carat plus stones, we'll say most of the world's 100 carat plus stones. Most of the world's 100 carat plus stones come from Sri Lanka. All right, now that leaves us with the last geographic place to talk about. And... This is an interesting place because we could all go there if we want to. And these are the Montana Sapphires, made in America. There's actually several different deposits in Montana. There's four of them that produce economically valuable sapphires. So let's go. Several deposits occur across the state. And I can show you where they are. Here's a map of Montana showing the deposits from the Lotus um, textbook. And so let's see, here's, so one is called Rock Creek, and here where we are in Montana. So we're in the southern central part of Montana, and so there's one called Rock Creek. There's another place here called Cottonwood Creek. There's a whole series on the banks of the Missouri River. And then, oh, where's the last one? Here's the other one that's really famous. It's called Yogo Gulch. They all form from different ways. These three deposits are alluvial, which means they're in the river gravels, and then Yogo Gulch is actually primary. Let's start by talking about Yogo Gulch. Well, one of the reasons why maybe you haven't heard about all these different sapphire locations is because there's a certain economic reality to the United States. Um, we're going to put, we'll put that here. There's an economic reality, and that reality is we have to pay more for our labor than in other places in the world. And we also have certain environmental protections. And both of those things, so let's say uh, increase cost, right? So there's the environmental protection and there is wages that are much higher than other countries. And so whereas these are beautiful sapphire deposits, we do not know about them and they're not mined as much because we cannot make a profit from them as well. So the Yogo Gulch location are some of the best sapphires in the world. They're almost all cornflower blue. They do not require heat treating at all because they come out of the ground that color. Let me show you how beautiful they can be. Here's an image from the Lotus textbook showing a Yogo sapphire and the beautiful cornflower blue color when it's faceted. But most of the stones coming from Yogo Gulch are really small. Most are less than one carat. And that's in the rough form, okay? In this form right here. And when you facet a stone, it even gets smaller. So faceted Yogos tend to be fairly small. Because the color is so great with that cornflower blue, no treatment is needed. So if you get a hold of it, Yogo, you can be assured that it hasn't been heat treated. The geologic source at Yogo is a dike of igneous rock that intrudes into um, 
local limestones. So let's say the geologic source is a dike and the sapphires are crystals embedded in it. The dike was in place 48 million years ago. Uh, that probably doesn't really matter too much. And it was discovered. So let's say the source of dike intruded into country rock. That dike was discovered in 1896, and it's been mined basically ever since. In the last few years, it hasn't been mined. It's kind of sitting in a defunct state. But here's a picture from Wikipedia showing a miner working. This is the face of the dike right here back in 1897. Some of the early miners from... Um, who owned Yogo Gulch were Brits. And so there actually has been some speculation that Kate Middleton Sapphire, let's say this, let's go, speculation, that Kate Middleton's Sapphire in her engagement ring is actually one of the largest Yogos out there. Others would say that's a load of hogwash. But guess what? We're in America. We can speculate those sort of things. Here's another really beautiful piece. This is probably the most expensive piece that's ever been made from Yogo Sapphires. It was made by Tiffany's back in the early 1900s. And it what ha that has is about 120 tiny little Yogos all set together to make this iris brooch. Brooch or brooch? I don't know. All right, so that's the story of Yogo. Let me tell you one more story about Montana sapphires from another location. Oh, cancel that. Go back to cancel. There we go. And these are going to be the alluvial sapphires from the three other locations. So we'll go, this is not Big B. Is this Little B? I've already forgotten. But these are going to be Montana's alluvial sapphires. These are at least three different locations and they all produce economically valuable stones the most famous of which and you can actually visit these if you want to are called Rock Creek and then this like the Spokane Bar and that's not bar as in where you get alcohol but as in like a gravel bar on the banks of the Missouri River you can visit these locations and buy bags of gravel and then hunt through them yourself to see what you can find. Most of the stones from these locations are fancy colors, and they're somewhat light, but you can find light blues to light greens the most commonly. One of the interesting things about Rock Creek, it actually has produced a lot. It's produced over 190 million carats over its lifetime of mining operation since 1906. So there's a lot of these out there. I think they make fantastic engagement rings for people who don't um, have interest in diamonds. And in fact, my brother's engagement ring that he gave once upon a time was a alluvial sapphire from Rock Creek. Well, that there you have it. We're done with corundum. We're going to move on to other gemstones next. If you have questions, we do not have a textbook on this right now in the semester, but I would point you to the Wikipedia section on corundum or sapphire because that is where I got a lot of this information. Bye.